Okay, so let me start with uh, actually showing you the review that you are supposed to read. I hope you have started reading it at least. Let me just share screen. I just want to give you kind of uh, maybe a bird's eye view. You know? uh, so this is the review. Um, you should read it. Um, and, you know, there are many topics here, as you can see in the review. And with the lecture yesterday and the next an hour and a half, we obviously cannot cover everything here. So what I've done so far actually is to cover maybe section one and two, if you want. A little bit, we have gone a little bit into section three already here. There are many topics here. So what I want to do today is to tell you a little bit about just wrapping up our discussion of uh, the basic equations, the wave dynamics. And then I'll tell you a little bit about soliton configuration or what is called boson stars, that's 3.2. Uh, and then uh, in fact, the most interesting aspect of this have to do with, do with eight wave interference. So we will actually spend probably uh, most of the time today talking about wave interference. That's one of those unique features of uh, dark matter being waves as opposed to particles. And so that would be basically the session 3.4 here. And then there are a lot of other effects that I'm not, I won't have time to cover. Some of them are actually fairly interesting and fun. For example, what happens around black holes? Um, there's the possibility of super radiance, for example, and so on. I won't have time to discuss uh, what, what I would do towards the end is to skip ahead to section four and tell you a little bit about the uh, observational and experimental implications. By observational, I mean uh, astronomical. Those typically are relevant if the mass of the wave diameter is ultralight around 10 to the minus 20 to 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. And by experiment, I mean uh, dark matter experiment, axion detection experiment. So I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end and that would be it. Uh, that, that's all that we could cover. Uh, so uh, I urge you to read the review, uh, contains a lot of details that I won't be able to cover uh, in the next hour and a half. All right, so let me stop sharing this screen. Um, in fact, let me actually just start by asking if there are any questions so far about yesterday. Um, I'm going to share a uh, screen with you to start with the slides that we ended with yesterday. I think it's this one. Let me play. Okay. So let me just pause here. Any questions before we start continuing on this discussion? Yeah, I see one here. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I see that people typically choose this uh, one minus cosinus potential because it reproduces this periodicity that we know this particle typically have, but could work to so the periodic part, the potentials in general? Yeah, in fact, you know, if you if you kind of decouple from the idea of this field being some sort of axion, i.e. some sort of uh, angular field. You could in principle think about any potential you want. It's, it's really up to you. Um, the idea of it being an axion is fairly appealing because it naturally explains why the mass is so small, that the mass actually comes from some non perturbative effects that give it the tiny mass. And, and in fact, without the non perturbative effects, it's supposed to be strictly massless because it's a Gaussian boson. But you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, once you open up this Pandora box of scalar field dark matter, at some level, it's up to you to invent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for asking. Now, you might notice actually when I, write down this equation, right? For example, this klein gordon equation. I have already ignored uh, interesting, possible interesting self-interactions of the scalar. And if you are allowed to tune the potential to whatever you want, you might want to tune the potential so that the self-interactions is actually important and it would change some of the story. 
So if you want, I'm actually giving you the minimalist version where uh, for the most part, all you need is to keep the quadratic term in the Lagrangian, m squared, phi squared, and the higher terms, uh, at least for the application we are gonna talk about are, are negligible, but you don't have to. You can consider cases where they are important. In fact, there's interesting work in that direction. Yeah. All right, um, so let's, let's pick up uh, where we left off yesterday. So yesterday I show you how to go from the Klein-Gordon to the Schrodinger equation, right? And I also told you that you should supplement the Schrodinger equation with the Poisson equation, which I added here, like so. The two equations actually form a closed system. And so you, in principle, you can solve it and make predictions. For example, the cosmological application would be to say, well, let me assume this complex scalar, we call, I'm going to call it the wave function, is uh, in the early universe is roughly homogeneous, but with small fluctuations that come from, let's say, inflation, for example. And then uh, gravity does the work for you in the sense that you evolve the system and you discover that places where the universe is slightly overdense, under gravity, they become even more overdense. And in fact, eventually those places are basically the size of galaxy formation. So um, this, this system of two equations basically tells you everything you needed to know. The only thing that you need to maybe modify these equations a little bit is to account for the expansion of the universe, which I, I'm not being very explicit here, but it's not, it's not a hard thing to do. You can find those equations in the review or references there are. Okay. Uh, one thing I do want to emphasize is that despite the appearance of the Schrodinger equation, this complex scalar, even though I'm going to call it the wave function uh, as is custom, uh, it's best to think of this as a classical scalar field. Meaning you should really just think of this as the analog of uh, the Maxwell equations, for example, in classical ENF. And, and so the wave effects that we are going to discuss, they are really uh, classical wave effects. Okay, so keep that in mind. In fact, uh, sort of by design, I, I hide all the H bar, H bar is set to one, so you cannot even see the H bar, uh, okay? Um, so that's one point I want to emphasize. Uh, and then the second point I want to introduce, which is kind of an alternative point of view, which is sometimes useful, uh, is usually uh, useful to look at a physical system from different points of view. The alternative points of view is to think of this as describing some sort of fluid. And it's a very interesting fluid, a little bit unusual fluid. And what do I mean by a fluid? Well, uh, let's take the wave function here side. It's a complex scalar, as we discussed. It should have an amplitude and a phase, right? Now the amplitude will naturally associate associated with the uh, square root of the density. In other words, rho, the mass density is just m psi square, which is a very natural interpretation, meaning psi square really represents um, the number density of the particles if you want. You multiply by the rest mass that give you the, the energy density. And again, we are in the non-relativistic limit. The energy density in, in principle should contain contribution of kinetic energy. That is ignored here. We are just including rest mass energy, but that's good enough for non-relativistic limit. So rho is, uh, is, the, uh, is the mass density in the dark matter and square root of that is what enters into the amplitude of the wave function. And then there's this phase, which I call theta here. And uh, you can convince yourself if you want to think of this as a fluid, in fact, you can. And um, this phase has an interpretation, which is that the uh, gradient of the phase can be interpreted as a velocity of the fluid, basically like so. Gradient of theta divided by m is the velocity. And this equation in fluid mechanics, you would call it mass conservation or continuity. Um, you might ask, where does this come from? Somehow it should come from this equation, the Schrodinger equation. Well, 
actually it's not hard to, to imagine where it comes from. You can, you can actually do the math very easily. Basically recall the following fact, right? In a given Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics, you have learned there's a property of the Schrodinger equation, which is probability conservation. Yeah. Uh, essentially, because there's a U1 symmetry. This equation has a U1 symmetry where you rotate side by, by a U1. And that tells you there's a conserved current. Uh, and in quantum mechanics, you will call that conservation of probability, which is basically probability is size square. You multiply by M, that is the mass and density. So you can basically recast what you knew as probability conservation in quantum mechanics now as mass conservation and it will be written in this way, where rho times V is the probability current. You can work that out. And it turns out that combination, you can convince yourself, take the forms of rho times a quantity, which we call naturally the fluid velocity and is actually the gradient the phase. So that's where this equation comes from. And, um, you know, in fluid mechanics, usually uh, at least we have two equations, that's mass conservation. The next equation would be some sort of uh, momentum conservation, if you want. Or here I write it as Euler equation, which is basically this equation. And again, just based on pure counting, it's very reasonable to have two equations because the Schrodinger equation is an equation for a complex quantity. So that should be a real and imaginary part if you want. So, there should be uh, two independent equations that come out of uh, the Schrodinger equation. And indeed, in the fluid interpretation, where you break apart the wave function into an amplitude and a phase, the two independent equations are these two equations. Now, the second equation, the Euler equation, I hope is fairly intuitive. Um, on the left-hand side is basically the Lagrangian time derivative of velocity. Think of this as acceleration moving with the fluid. And if you ask uh, what is pushing the fluid element around, clearly there should be gravity. This is the gradient of the gravitational potential. And because this is really wave mechanics, there is an additional term in the literature is often called quantum pressure here, uh, but it's a bit of a misleading term, I have to say, uh, because Actually, uh, this term is neither quantum nor pressure. Uh, it's not quantum in the sense of what I explained before, that it's best to think of the wave function as just a class two scalar. And it's not actually even strictly pressure. If you are familiar with Euler equation, this term should take the form of gradient of pressure divided by rho. This is not actually of that form. Nonetheless, this term has stuck in the, uh, in the literature, if you read, for example, um, I don't know whether you have uh, read, you probably, you, many of you probably have read a Feynman lectures, Feynman lectures volume three on quantum mechanics. If you open that up, go to the last chapter, you will find actually a derivation of this equation from the Schrodinger equation. This term you can actually work out. Once again, all you are doing is to split up the wave function into an amplitude and a phase, and you can find this equation. This, equation, this term really encapsulates the fact that what you have underlying this fluid is some kind of waves. And this term contains all the interesting dynamics that has to do with uh, wave interference, for example. And this term is called quantum pressure also for, for may, may, maybe, uh, maybe a, a somewhat motivated reason because this, is some kind of pressure that tends to um, have an effect that's similar to fluid pressure. For example, we know fluid pressure suppresses fluctuations. Uh, it can counteract gravity, for example. But as we, I will also try to convince you in let's say 15 minutes or half an hour, uh, this quantum pressure can actually do uh, counterintuitive things in that instead of suppressing fluctuations, it could also enhance uh, it could also enhance uh, enhance fluctuations as we will see. Okay, so these are the two different points of view. I'm going to call this the wave point of view, Schrodinger equation plus Poisson, or the fluid point of view, basically mass conservation Euler equation plus Poisson. Either way, uh, they describe basically this system.
So those are the basic equations we are going to work with. It's fairly simple. And we are going to try to draw as many implications as we can out of it uh, without doing too much work. That's the, that's the plan. Any questions before we start? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm, I'm just confused as to the interpretation of psi as this, um, I guess, number density. Can you explain that again? Why is it number density? Okay, yeah. so good, good, good. Um, in fact, you can go back to the kind of the original. If you think, if you think about the original Klein coordinate. In fact, let me step back now. Let me go to an earlier slide. Think about the original Klein coordinate. So, so the Lagrangian is basically this term, the phi square. As we said, we are going to approximate the potential as m square phi square because you are oscillating very close to the minimum anyway. So your Lagrangian is this phi square, m square, phi square. And, and let's say you ask yourself, I am, let's say I have a phi that's oscillating around the minimum with frequency m. And you ask yourself, given that Lagrangian, you should be able to figure out what is the energy density associated with the scalar field that oscillates with frequency m. And you can convince yourself it must be of the order of m square, phi square, basically. That's the energy density. Okay. Now, if you buy that, if you buy that statement, then it's fairly easy because then it's just a matter of definition almost. Because I chose phi to be related to psi by this equation. And you can check if I say energy density rho is m square phi square is the same as saying rho is m psi square just by. In fact, that is the point of this normalization, if you want. Does that make any sense? It's almost a matter of definition. Once you accept energy density, it's just m squared phi squared. If you're willing to accept that, the rest follows. Okay. Yeah. Um, you might wonder, you might wonder what where where does this one over the square of two m come from? I mean, there are many ways to motivate it. One way to motivate is just what I just said. Um, somehow you want to define a complex scalar whose interpretation carries the meaning of number density. And with this normalization, m squared phi squared get turned into m psi squared. So psi squared has that interpretation. Or you can just count dimension, right? In four dimensions, the scalar field has mass dimension one, right? It, has, it's, it goes like mass. If you scale this with this, factor of one over square root of two M, then psi actually has dimension three half. Yeah. And therefore if, if a psi square is a number density. So that's another way to, to say what, what I just told you. Yeah. Or yet another way, if you're familiar with uh, actually quantizing, uh, quantizing scalar field, which I, uh, I'm sure you have seen. Uh, when you quantize scalar field, you might recall very often there is uh, when you relate a, a phi to a and a dagger, usually there's a factor of one over two omega or one over square root two omega. You can think of this factor as basically descending from there. Basically, many ways to think about that. In any case, if you accept this definition, it just follows. M squared phi squared give you m psi squared. In other words, the amplitude of the oscillation, if you want, actually tells you how many axion particles there are, basically. All right, good. Um, so we have this system of equations. Now we are going to explore the consequences, right? We want to actually think about the wave dynamics. And I'm going to start by, uh, sorry, this is just a, a footnote. Again, I, I refer to Feynman lectures in fact, there is a helpful discussion of what the wave function means when you have high occupancy, when you have large number of uh, particles in the same state, in what sense you can interpret it classically. There's a discussion there, which uh, you're welcome to read. I'm going to skip that. Um, let me skip this slide. We have a lot to cover. So what are these wave effects? that I'm talking about. I want to just show you this little movie to kind of uh, emphasize, emphasize that aspect. 
So let me just play it and then I'll explain, right? Um, this movie is from a cosmological simulation. Basically, you, you literally put the Poisson equation and the Schrodinger equation on a computer, give the fluctuation small amplitude initially, uh, a Gaussian random field with uh, 10 to the minus five fluctuations in the early universe and just let it evolve. And in the late universe, you will see something like this. This is not an, a literal movie in time. This is actually a, a, a computer simulation in the late universe, basically some cubic box. And I'm just showing you slices through that simulation. Okay, so this is not a movie in time, it's a movie in space. Just showing you, let me just play again. Um, right. And what I want to emphasize, and you can see clearly by eye, that because you have wave dark matter, you clearly see interference uh, fringes. It's basically unavoidable. Uh, and you see that both inside galaxy halo or around galaxy halo. You can think of this as a galaxy halo, this end of the galaxy halo. And there's a, actually a filament connecting them. And imagine you have a halo that is filled with waves of different momenta, let's say, or different energy. And let's say these waves have somewhat random phase. Then uh, just by random chance, there will be places where you have constructive interference. And then there will be places where you have destructive interference between these waves. And therefore you see this interference pattern. So it's a, a kind of a, a fairly interesting prediction of wave dark matter is always going to be there. And I, as I will explain um, a little later, there is a characteristic scale to this interference pattern, which is basically the De Broglie wavelength. So if you tell me this system, this galaxy has a velocity dispersion of a certain number, let's say 100 kilometers per second. And if you tell me the mass of the wave that matter, you take one over MV or H bar over MV if you want, that's the De Broglie wavelength. And that would give you the typical size of these interference fringes, basically. Okay. Uh, and obviously, the smaller the mass, the bigger the De Broglie wavelength. Um, and this phenomenon, the fact that there's this, I, I'm going to call this interference substructure, right? It has to do with uh, the wave nature of that matter. Is something that um, was first fairly clearly dem demonstrated um, in numerical simulation by this group. Um, Shai, Chiu, and Broughters, and then later on confirmed by uh, many other groups, inc including ours. So that, this, is, this is basically where we're heading. We want to kind of uh, find the distinctive features of having waves as dark matter. What are those distinctive features? Um, I have a very long list here, you can see, uh, and obviously I won't be able to go through all of them. Um, I'm going to hopefully be able to talk about at least the first four. Maybe we'll talk about dynamic, dynamical friction. I'm not sure if we have time. Let me start with the top now. Uh, and the top has to do with the following. In fact, I think it's helpful to step back a little bit. Look, let's look at the equations again. For example, let's look at this equation. If I look at this equation, um, Let's imagine you do perturbation theory, yeah? In cosmology, in large scale structure, to do perturbation theory means what? It means that you assume the velocity is small and you assume rho is very close to being homogeneous. So rho is equal to some rho bars, the spatial average plus delta rho, which is the fluctuation, which is supposed to be small. And assuming both delta rho and v is small, you can linearize this equation and just solve it. And, and in fact, it's, uh, it's fairly simple to solve. And it turns out, uh, as you might imagine, the effect of this term, the quantum pressure term, is to suppress fluctuations on small scale. That's what it does. And I hope it's fairly intuitive why it has stronger effect on small scale because you see this has actually many gradients, right? This is actually actually three gradients. So this is a term that tends to dominate at, uh, at, at small scales or at high momenta, high K, uh, we are going to call it K, at high K, this term becomes important. And then quantum pressure has the effect 
of suppressing fluctuations on small scales. Okay. Um, let me also point out, if you look at the scaling, and this is a useful way of looking at what's going on. The quantum pressure term, not only does it have three spatial gradients, it also scale like one over M square. So what does this tell you? It tells you the quantum pressure term is more important if the wave that matter is extremely light. For small mass, this term becomes more important. In fact, if you take the limit, the opposite limit, that M is very high, you go all the way to the mass of wind, you know, typical wind, uh, 100 GeV or something like that. This term becomes very unimportant. You really have to go to extremely small scale before you see any effect. And usually those scales are so small that it's basically astronomically unimportant. On the other hand, if the mass is really light, then there's some chance the scales where this is important might be astronomically important. And in fact, that's, that's what we are going to talk about, okay? Um, so the first, kind of the first point I want to make is what linear perturbation theory tells you, which is basically the point of this slide, okay? So this, this is my one line summary of what, what I just said. Linear perturbation theory for wave diameter predicts suppressed power at high K, right? I hope you have all seen uh, pictures of power spectrum. It looks something like this. This is K, high K, high momentum means small scales, small length scales. This is large length scales, low K. On the Y axis in the, is the power spectrum. And people call, refer to the power spectrum, actually uh, use it to denote two different things. They might be talking about P of K, which is a dimension four quantity. Here, what I call the power spectrum delta square is actually a dimension less quantity. It's actually K cubed P of K. Don't worry about the factors of two pi, this is just convention. Uh, in other words, delta square basically give you, in some sense, the variance of perturbations at the corresponding scale. So you can see the fluctuations are very small at low K on large scale, and then it progressively, progressively become bigger and bigger. Now, if you have something like wind dark matter, so the mass of the dark matter particle is pretty large, you should have a power spectrum, a linear power spectrum. I emphasize linear here, mean, meaning this is really the power spectrum just predicted by linear perturbation theory. Of course, in the late universe, the fluctuations become so large that you have to account for the nonlinear dynamics. We'll come to that, right? But at least if you do linear perturbation theory, the solid line, the top one is what linear perturbation theory predicts for uh, a diameter particle whose mass is pretty big. Big enough that you don't have to worry about quantum pressure. So this is the top line. If you want, think of that the top line as the canonical wind dark matter if you want. Whereas if you uh, think about wave dark matter, the linear power spectrum is cut off at high K and where that cut off is depends on the mass. For example, this is 10 to the minus 22 electron volts. This is minus 20. And of course you can choose any mass you want. So, but in any case, according to linear perturbation theory, you can work out what the cutoff is, right? And because the power according to linear perturbation theory is cut off at high K, you can hope to actually constrain this kind of idea by just measuring as best as you can the linear perturbation theory uh, power spectrum of dark matter. If you have good data that cover a wide range of scales so that you can actually probe this, especially the high K small scales, then you can put constraints on, okay, what kind of wave dark matter mass is rule out? Okay, so that's kind of the first point I want to make. There's a conceptual point. Any questions about that? Uh, yeah, so this is when we uh, look at approximation with the uh, rows, the uh, average row, and the velocity of slow, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, how much does this power spectrum change if we don't make the approximations on the or just general? Yeah, if you allow nonlinearity, actually it's changed quite a bit. So, so let me give you an example. Uh, forget about wave dark matter for the moment, just you have conventional cold dark matter. So you, have, you should have this top curve, right? Wind dark matter. Now, uh, if you allow for nonlinearity, what actually happens is that the nonlinearity has the uh, 
tendency to enhance the power. So for example, let's look at the scale, which is often called the nonlinear scale. If you ask at what scale is the fluctuation amplitude or the one, you can see you draw a horizontal line from one and you come down, it's around K of 0.2. That's often called the nonlinear scale. And what the nonlinearity does is the following, is that at K higher than the nonlinear scale, which is basically here, the power is actually enhanced. That's, that's what the nonlinearity in the dynamics does for you. And, and therefore, if you measure something in the lay universe, for example, you have to be a little bit careful how you interpret the data because it's fairly likely some of what you're measuring is in the nonlinear regime. You should not just use the linear power spectrum to interpret what's going on, yeah. Thank you. Whereas the strength of the CMB, for example, as you probably know, is that the, uh, the CMB mostly probe fluctuations uh, so far back in redshift, that the fluctuations are basically almost entirely in the linear regime. So you can use linear perturbation theory. But the CMB also has a limitation. Uh, the CMB tends to probe fluctuations on a fairly large scale, meaning low K. So you are probing basically this part of the spectrum. Whereas if you want to see the effect of wave that matter, this kind of suppression, you need data that go out to high K and that typically rely on basically data from low redshift for which you have to be careful how to interpret the data as I said, yeah? You have to be careful, you have accounted for the nonlinearity properly, yeah. Okay, and in fact, now I'm gonna give you an example of that, right? So if you look through the literature, probably some of the strongest constraints on where that meta comes from what is called line method forest. This is the term. Um, I'm going to give you kind of a cartoon, kind of a cartoon version of what this is about. The idea is actually very simple. It's the following. Imagine you are the observer, this is you here pointing a telescope at uh, not quite a star, something that's very far away, usually a quasar. So it's a um, some object that is a, a bright source of photons at high redshift. It doesn't really matter what is the engine behind that source, is you have a bright source. And you are able to, in fact, not only see the quasar, but you can take a spectrum. So you see the photon spectrum as a function of energy. And as the photons from the quasar travel to you, so the photons get redshifted, right? And there would be some photon that get redshifted to just the right frequency that correspond to Lyman alpha. Lyman alpha, as you might uh, recall, is the transition between ground state and first excited state of hydrogen. And therefore, if, if let's say here, your photons reach that frequency uh, corresponding to Lyman alpha, and let's say around that place, somewhere in the intergalactic medium, there's some neutral hydrogen, that hydrogen is going to absorb that photon. And depending on the density of the neutral hydrogen in that patch of the intergalactic medium, you might have a lot of absorption or you might have very little absorption. And so when you take a spectrum of the quasar, you are going to see fluctuations. And the fluctuation reflect basically the hydrogen density. I draw this little wave here just to illustrate the idea that you should see fluctuations basically. And that's what this lima for forest measurement is about. They measure fluctuation in neutral hydrogen at redshift of a field. I, I show you this data. This points with error bar is actual data at redshift of a field. And this is essentially the power spectrum, although let me not go into precisely what power spectrum this is, but this is roughly the power spectrum I show you, although it's not really that, but it's some kind of fluctuation measured of the fluctuation in neutral hydrogen density as a function of scale, which is K. Again, small scale is here, large scale is here. This is high K, okay? And um, of course, what they measure is, once again, you have to be careful. You are somewhat in the nonlinear regime as the questions asked earlier. You have to account for that. Also, what you are measuring is not exactly that meta fluctuation. You are measuring, measuring hydrogen fluctuations. You have, you have to basically do some kind of modeling to go from 
fluctuation in hydrogen to fluctuation in dark matter. That involves some assumptions, obviously. But in any case, after making some assumptions, uh, people are able to put constraints on, on wave dark matter. And, and essentially, if you make the wave dark matter mass too small, then the power will be too suppressed to account for what is observed, basically. That's the idea. That's what some of this dash curve is about. Uh, however, uh, and, and, and I should say, I can give you a number. Roughly speaking, the uh, current Lima forest constraint seems to, uh, according, for example, you read this paper, this is one of the earlier paper that give a constraint from, from a few years ago. Their constraint is roughly a few times 10 to the minus 21 electron volt. They, they, they basically, the claim is they can rule out a wave diameter mass less than a few times 10 to the minus 21 electron volts. Okay. Um, but all, but, but I, I, would, I, would, uh, I would add maybe a grain of salt to this interpretation. And you can actually see uh, kind of what I'm talking about uh, on this dash line. So for example, if you look at, I don't know whether you can see this different line symbol, but if you look at, let's just look at the highest redshift data where the constraint actually is the strongest. The, the solid line is if you want the wind dark matter prediction, no, no suppression of uh, small scale power and it fits the data very nicely. That's nice. The, the, the lowest dot dash line, which is right here, is the wave dark matter prediction. And clearly it fails to match data at high K and therefore that's where their constraint comes from, right? Uh, however, you might ask, well, how about this dash line? What is that about? Well, the dash line is actually by uh, accounting for the fact that when I convert from hydrogen fluctuation to dark matter fluctuations, there are actually many steps, many assumptions involved. For example, let me just give you an example. For example, I have to be careful about what the temperature of the intergalactic medium is. What's the temperature of the hydrogen? That turns out, as you might imagine, if I make the temperature high, uh, that would cause the hydrogen lines to be broadened and therefore, the fluctuation would be suppressed at high K, a similar effect to wave star matter. And you have to be careful about that kind of stuff. And the dash line is where you allow um, the, uh, the, the temperature of the intergalactic medium to be a free parameter as well, for example. And already, if you do that, even for wave star matter of the same mass as basically this dot dash line, you can bring up the curve and get closer to the data. You still miss the last point by a little bit. That's where the constraints come from. Um, and then there are additional effects that are not even accounted for in kind of current state of the art. For example, a high redshift in particular, you are getting close to the redshift when the universe first get reionized. And reionization is a fairly messy and inhomogeneous process. And that inhomogeneity can get imprinted itself on the data that you might have to account for and so on. So there are, there are a number of kind of, if you want simplifying assumptions that you could make to make the constraint uh, as strong as possible, but you could also relax those assumptions, which seems fairly reasonable to relax and which would make the constraint weaker. So at the moment I would say, um, I, I, it's hard to, who, to give you a very precise number, but I think if you are super conservative, I think you can probably rule out anything lighter than 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. Whether you can rule out anything lighter than 10 to the minus 21 electron volt, I think that is uh, subject to further research, I would say, um, okay? Um, so this is all I have to say about you know, constraints based on basically trying to attempt to measure the linear power spectrum and observe that suppression of power. If you have a very reliable way of measuring that linear power spectrum, it is a very powerful method. You, you can actually try to constrain wave that method this way. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Why does the Lyman alpha force constraint give us 
why, why does the light analysis work like give us better constraints than say measuring the power spectrum from galaxies? From galaxies? Yeah, very good. The, the Lyman van forest constraint, first of all, the Lyman forest actually allow you to go to higher redshift. If you think about typical galaxy power spectrum, usually at best they go up to redshift one, maybe not even, not even redshift one. And the, the higher redshift you are able to go, in some sense, the more linear the fluctuations are. The, the, so it's easier to model based on your measurements kind of reverse the effect of the nonlinear dynamics to get at the linear power spectrum. For galaxy power spectrum, because they typically are at lower redshift, it's actually harder. That's the main reason. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good question, yeah. All right, very good. Um, so that's the linear power spectrum method if you want, um, okay. Let's, let's go to the next subject. I want to give you some kind of, uh, it's very useful to have back of envelope kind of estimate, rough estimate of different effects. So I want to show you how that is done. And um, let me show you the next slide. Okay, what am I showing you here? Um, I am showing you three quantities, three possible effects that might be relevant that you might want to consider. And they are all given uh, in terms of some form of energy density. The first one I hope is fairly uh, intuitive because as you expand out that cosine, there should be a quadric term. So I, so I call it lambda phi to the fourth. So this is basically the self interaction of the epsilon. And if you ask what is the energy density associated with the self interaction? Well, of course you would say lambda phi to the fourth, right? So let me, let me call, call it that. The second term is the energy density, I would say, associated with gravity. And what kind of number would you assign to that? Well, a, a rough way to do it is the following. You tell me the gravitational potential inside your galaxy or whatever environment you're interested in. I multiply that by the local density, rho times phi. That is basically the gravitational energy density, if you want. The last one is basically uh, I would say gradient energy and density. Remember the Lagrangian has a d phi square term, right? The phi square roughly speaking is phi square divided by some length scale square. So it's phi square over r square. This gradient energy is in fact the origin of the quantum pressure term I was talking about earlier in the fluid interpretation. So I want to kind of uh, spend a, little, a few minutes just comparing these three terms, okay? And um, here I'm rewriting each of the term in a way that's helpful to us. First of all, lambda five fourth, you might ask what is that lambda? Lambda, if you go back to that cosine, that lambda is actually m squared over f squared. It's basically this combination. Remember m is the mass of the axion and f is the axion decay constant. If you go back to that cosine, you can check this, this lambda is m squared over f squared. And then I do one more step. I want to uh, relate phi, the amplitude of phi to rho. And here is, I, I'm going to invoke what I said earlier. Rho is basically m squared phi squared. And so I can replace phi by rho. And therefore I have this expression. So this is the self interaction energy density in an environment with a given rho, then it would go like rho squared. Okay, so self interaction becomes important when the density is very high because it goes like row square. So keep that in mind, right? How about gravity? Well, gravitational potential energy goes like row times phi. And how, how are we going to uh, um, estimate the gravitational potential? Well, we'll do the simplest possible thing. We'll do G M over R. Imagine I have a region of size R. The mass enclosed is row times R cubed. And therefore, this is my estimate of the gravitational potential. And I combine everything together. I have G rho square R square. This is the gravitational potential energy. It also goes like rho square, but in addition, it actually becomes bigger when your region is bigger. It goes like R square, basically because the mass enclosed becomes bigger. Okay? So that's, that's the contribution of gravity. 
And lastly, uh, gradient energy, I just replaced phi squared over R squared. Again, using the fact that rho is m squared phi squared, written like so. All right. And here is my little cartoon. It's actually a helpful way. I find a helpful way of thinking about what's going on. If I draw energy density for these three different components versus R, the size of the region you're interested in, I'm going to imagine I keep rho fixed. And this might or might not be a reasonable thing to do. You might want to consider a situation where rho change with R. I have in mind a situation where rho is just given. For example, let's say I tell you what is the dark matter density inside the Milky Way, what is the typical density. So you just plug in that number for rho. And then the only thing you can vary is basically the size of the region, R. So I'm plotting these three components as a function of R for a fixed row. So keep that in mind, right? I'm fixing row. And if I do that, you can kind of see the behavior, which is a useful way to think about what's going on. At large R, you are definitely dominated by gravity. You see this term, it grows like R squared. At small R though, you are definitely dominated by gradient energy, basically quantum pressure, that's the blue line. The self-interaction term is in fact horizontal. And the way I draw it, I actually intentionally draw it so that it's actually below where the blue and the red line cross. If that is true, it means basically self-interaction is not important at any radius, which means you can just ignore it. However, uh, of course, this horizontal line, I can scale up and down in particular by changing the axion decay constant, no? because neither the gravity nor the gradient energy depends on the axion decay constant. So if I make the axion decay constant small enough, this horizontal line would go up. And if it go up to a degree so that it sticks above where the blue and the red line cross, then there will be some scale where the self-interaction is actually important. And you should take that into account. And, and so um, you should just keep in mind this way of thinking about it. And, and therefore you can give very rough estimate, you know, tell me your axion mass, tell me your axion decay constant. Then I can tell you, should I worry about self-interaction or not inside your galaxy? That's something very easy to do. And I actually work out the numbers in the review article. I'm not writing out the expression. So you can read a particular footnote in that review is in footnote 10. Uh, in case you haven't encountered it. So I gave you all the numbers there. And it's basically by doing this, this argument that I just gave. And essentially for a lot of the parameter space, most, I would say most of the interesting parameter space, so to speak, uh, for a dark matter density that is Milky Way-like, for example, self-interaction is indeed unimportant. However, uh, you can certainly find regions of parameter space where that's not true, right? So, so keep that in mind. So that's the number one point I want to make. The number two point I want to make, actually before I go to number two and uh, the other two points, let me pause for questions. Um, any questions? All right, good. Um, Second, second point I want to make is um, let's compare, let's imagine uh, once again, that self-interaction can be ignored. So let me ignore it for now. So I'm just going to focus on two and three, right? And for two and three, the interesting question to ask is where is this scale where it cross over from being quantum pressure dominated or gradient energy dominated to gravity dominated? What is the crossover scale? Well. Actually, it's very easy to estimate. You are just comparing gravity potential phi versus one over m squared r squared. What I have done is I have factored out this. You see this row here, and you also see this row here. Let's just cancel them. So you just have to compare phi, the gravity potential, with one over m squared r squared. Okay. And I further do one more thing, which is to invoke Vario theorem. If you have a galaxy that is in equilibrium, we say varialized, 
the scale of the gravity potential inside the Milky Way should be of the order of the velocity dispersion of the objects inside that galaxy. So V square or V is the velocity dispersion of that galaxy. And just to give you a concrete idea for the Milky Way, the velocity dispersion is around 200 kilometer per second. Um, okay, so if I estimate the gravity potential by V square, then if I equate V square with one over M square R square to find the transition scale, which is this crossover point, you can see the crossover is precisely the broadly wavelength, one over MV. Yeah. So this is and that, this is one way where the, the broadly wavelength shows up, basically. In other words, if I tell you I have a galaxy with a certain velocity dispersion, you can very easily estimate at what scale quantum pressure would start become important. At scale of the order of the broadly waving or smaller, quantum pressure actually would dominate over gravity, okay? So that's one useful estimate. And it's really just the broadly waving, very simple. Any questions about that? Okay, the last point I want to make, again, based on this uh, very simple estimate, is to consider an object. And this object that have a different name, different names in the literature is sometimes called a soliton, sometimes called an axion star, sometimes just called a boson star. And it's basically an object uh, of the following kind. It's an object that uh, is self-gravitating, so it has gravitational attraction. And that object is prevented from collapse under gravity by essentially quantum pressure. The quantum pressure or the gradient energy counteracts the gravity and the two just balance each other to form uh, a self-contained, self-gravitating and stable object basically. And that configuration, sometimes people call it an axion star or boson star, sometimes call it soliton. And we can very easily estimate the properties of this object, again, just by balancing these two quantities, okay? And this is basically that equation, right? Again, I'm now I'm balancing gravity potential. And here, this is really the self-gravity potential of that object. So if I tell you the mass of that object, m soliton, and I tell you the size of that object, r soliton, gm over r is, of course, the gravity potential the self gravity potential of that object, I balance that against what? Quantum pressure, one over m squared r squared. And again, it's just come, come from comparing two and three. And if they are equal, I can read off actually the size of the star, the soliton is of this size. And if you like natural units, uh, which I do, this is of the order of m Planck square over the axion mass square and the soliton mass. And, and you can easily see it has the correct mass dimension to be the size of the soliton. Okay, any questions about that? Um, let me make a few comments about this now, about this object. First of all, you notice this object has a size that scale like one over the mass of that object, which means the more massive the soliton is, the more compact it is. Yeah, the more massive it is, the more compact it is. And, and um, in fact, um, from numerical simulations, people have observed that solitons, they tend to condense at the centers of uh, galactic halos. For example, if the Milky Way halo is made out of uh, wave dark matter, we expect the central region to be basically a soliton-like configuration. It's a configuration, once again, where the cell gravity is balanced by quantum pressure. Okay. And the, uh, and the size of the, so the mass of the soliton seems to uh, scale with the mass of the halo. Uh, from the numerical simulation, it seems to be a scale as mass of the halo to the one third power. I didn't write that down here. 
But essentially, the more massive the halo, the more massive that soliton, which also means from this equation is going to be, become more compact. Uh, now, yeah, please. So uh, I guess I'm not understanding why we're uh, making effort to define this soliton. I mean, I guess I'm imagining at the center of the galaxy, there's this region where the bottom pressure is going to be equal to the gravity. But I mean, outside of this radius, there still could be more dark matter piled on, right? So yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I guess why 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 is this uh, radius special? I guess. Oh, why is that special? Um, if you look at the galaxy density profile, uh, as you, I, sh I should have, I should have drawn the picture. If you look at the usual uh, WIM diameter prediction, as you might know, uh, the galaxy density profile goes like out to the minus three at large radius, and then it turns over to out to the minus one, is what is called the Navarro, Frank, and White profile (NFW). That out to the minus one, at some point, if you have wave dark matter, becomes actually flat; is out to the zero. And that flat region is called the core. And that flat region appears to be more or less the size of that soliton. So is a, is, you, you, are, you, are, you are definitely correct that, of course, there's stuff outside that inner region anyway. So it's not really completely isolated. However, just based on the shape of the density profile, the fact that it becomes flat, there's a kind of a useful radius. We usually we call it the core radius. And that seems uh, actually roughly also the size of the soliton. That's how we uh, attach a link scale, if you want, to that inner region. It's basically where the core is. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, there's also a question in the chat. I'm not sure if you saw it. Please go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's in the Zoom chat, so it says. Um, uh, I cannot. I, yeah, I cannot see if you can read the question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it says that do solitons consist only of axons then, or of different kinds of particles, dark matter and standard model ones? Uh, you mean uh, different kind of dark matter particles coexisting? Yeah. Actually, Felix, you can uh, unmute yourself if you want. Yes. Can you hear me? Um, I, I can, uh, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. I was just asking uh, myself whether yeah. these solitons that you introduce are just object that only consists of the dark matter particles that we're talking about, or also consider standard model particles or all other gravitating particles that there might exist. Very good. So this configuration only accounts for um, the dark matter, the axion that compose the soliton. Of course, uh, in reality, you know, you, you almost never have completely isolated dark matter. There are always baryons around and stars and so on. If they are a significant fraction of that object, then obviously you should account for it in, in deducing its structure. It's going to change the size and so on. You have to be careful. So this is actually just the simplest possible configuration, which is one where is dark matter dominated. Now, if you ask, when I look at centers of galaxies, do we know whether they are dark matter dominant or not? I can tell you some galaxies uh, has regions that are very clearly baryon dominated. For example, if you look at the center of the Milky Way, it's fairly clearly is actually baryon dominated, not dark matter dominated. On the other hand, uh, if you look at some, for example, especially dwarf galaxies, they, tend, they seem to be dark matter dominated. So for those, this might be a good estimate. But for places where it's not, then you, you should modify this estimate if you really want to model the central regions of realistic galaxies. Then, that thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much for clarifying. Thank you for asking. Um, okay, so let me, let me, let me uh, pose a question for you. I have this soliton whose size becomes smaller and smaller as I make the mass of the soliton bigger and bigger. Now, question for you, can I make the soliton mass arbitrarily big so that the soliton is arbitrarily compact? What do you think? It's not a trick question, probably. I, the, the, the reason I asked the question, there's an obvious answer. Um, 
you cannot make the soliton arbitrarily compact, but how do you estimate? Is there any idea? Yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear that clearly. I think you I think you can calculate the values at the at which it will become a black hole. Excellent, excellent. So therefore, let's say imagine in your head on the left hand side, this our soliton, I set it to be the uh, the horizon size of an object with the same m soliton mass. So basically set our soliton to be 2gm, where m is m soliton, right? If you set that to be equal to the right-hand side, you can actually deduce what is the maximum mass for that soliton. You understand what I'm saying? You would not be able to exceed that soliton mass because if you try to exceed it, your object would just collapse into a black hole anyway. So it's some sort of Chandrasekhar mass, if you want, for the boson star, which you can work out this way in a very simple way. Yeah. And again, uh, I'm not giving you the numbers. You are urged to read the lecture notes. If you look at equation 22 to 24, you can find what is that maximum mass. I plug in the numbers for you. Uh, what is the, some sort of Chandrasekhar mass for the solitons? Okay. And it's something useful to know. And by the way, let me just add one more comment to that. No, when I make the soliton mass bigger and bigger, the soliton is going to be more compact. At some point, even before it becomes a black hole, the soliton is so compact. It means the density is actually so high because the self interaction actually goes like a uh, row square you might have to worry that object uh, has such high density, you might have to start worrying about self-interaction. And indeed that is true actually. And meaning if the soliton mass is big enough, at some point self-interaction is important. And in fact, that actually modifies the Chandrasekhar mass. The Chandrasekhar mass would be a little bit lower than the estimate that I just gave you. And if you look at equation 24 in the lecture notes, you will find that estimate, okay? So they are all given there. I'm not, I'm not uh, writing, writing them down here. And so this is all I have to say about by way of just doing these simple estimates and looking at interesting equilibrium configurations if you want. Now, of course, not all bound objects in the universe are in the form of soliton. For example, if you look at galaxy, like the Milky Way, if you ask in the Milky Way, what is actually counteracting gravity? Well, it's actually not so much quantum pressure per se. In the central region, maybe where you have a soliton, quantum pressure counteracts gravity. But in the, uh, in the larger galaxy, what is countering gravity is just good old motions of particles, motion of the axions, very realized motion. That is what is counteracting gravity. Um, and, and, uh, and in fact, most galaxies, uh, as long as you stay away from the very central region where there might be a soliton, the main counteracting force as in, against gravity is just varialized motion, okay? All right, let's see. So we have covered the first two topics and now I'm gonna ask Marco to see how much time do I have remaining? Have about 25 minutes. 25 minutes. 25. Perfect. Okay, 35 minutes. Perfect. Perfect. I think we would have 25. 25. Okay. Yeah, up to 5 p.m. our time, which is probably very good. Very yeah, good. Okay. Can you can you give me a warning when I have 10 minutes left? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So in the in the time in the time remaining, I want to tell you uh, about the interference substructure and one very interesting manifestation, which is vortices, okay? Um, before I launch onto that subject, let me pause here for questions. No? Okay, so interference substructure. I'm gonna just give you the general idea. And probably this is, this is uh, the, the simplest way to explain what's going on. So let's imagine I have a galaxy halo, 
And let's call the wave function that describe all the details of the halo psi. This wave function is going to be a function of time and space in general. And what makes up this wave function? Um, well, you can imagine this wave function is a superposition of plane waves, plane waves of moment, different momenta k. Is the anna of thinking of a halo as composing of particles moving around with different velocity. Here, this is just waves moving around with different velocity. So these are plane waves with definite momenta. Um, each of these waves have a definite energy. Omega k is because we are in the non-relativistic regime. It's just k squared over two m, basically given here. That is that that is the omega k here, and the superposition of this plane wave is basically dictated by what I gave you here. The superposition amplitude is a complex quantity. So I'm pulling out the amplitude, which I call A of K, and I'm calling the phase, the B of K basically, okay? Let me talk about the phase first. This is the phase for each plane wave, right? And if you have a halo that is fully variolized in equilibrium, it's fairly reasonable to assume this phase is basically random. Um, and this, again, this is the analog of thinking about particles. Imagine you have a, a galaxy with lots of particles moving around. Um, it would be very strange if all the particles are orbiting with the same phase. In fact, if you think about it, in general, it's probably kind of messy, different particles orbiting with different phases. And so that's what this random phase is about, B of K, random phase. It's a simple assumption. Uh, realistic halo need not have exactly random phase, but at least it's a zero order approximation. And you can actually fairly easily show, given this random phase, uh, psi itself, which is a superposition of uh, waves with random phases, is actually a Gaussian random field. And you can work out the statistics very easily. Uh, all the uh, higher point function can be expressed in terms of the two point function. Um, so that's the number one point I want to make. The number two point I want to make, how about this amplitude? How should different momenta be, be distributed in amplitude? Well, it should be controlled by this A of K. The most simple A of K that just as an example, is basically this uh, Gaussian distribution uh, e to the minus k square distribution. k zero square is just a scale that define, if you want, the momentum dispersion. This gives you a width, right? This is like a Gaussian with some width. That width is k zero. And this kind of Gaussian distribution is fairly uh, natural. If you think of Basically, again, a halo that is basically kind of like in thermal equilibrium. This is some, something analogous to having uh, a, a Maxwell distribution, basically, um, thermal equilibrium. Again, realistic halos are probably not exactly in thermal equilibrium, but to zero order is a good starting point, okay? K0 is, again, the width of the uh, momentum distribution, the Gaussian distribution, and it's a characteristic momentum scale, or if you want a momentum dispersion, you can turn that into a length scale, but by, by just doing one over K zero. Again, you know, when you do Fourier transform, K and X is the Fourier pair. So if you want a length scale, you do a one over K zero. And of course, uh, K zero being a momenta, momentum must be M times some velocity. And once again, you see that the broadly wavelength filling up, okay? So there is a characteristic scale just because there is a, um, a width to the momentum distribution. That width determines the de Broglie scale, okay? And this is, in fact, this is what determines this, the size of this interference pattern, basically, okay? And the last point I want to make is that not only is there a characteristic length scale, there's a characteristic time scale. Because again, omega k is k squared over 2m. And if you plug in this characteristic k0, which is the width of the Gaussian, um, this becomes the characteristic frequency 
And if you do one over that, ignoring the factor of two, you will get one over mv squared, which is the de Broglie time. It's nothing other than the de Broglie scale divided by another power of velocity, the velocity dispersion. This is the de Broglie time. Now, what is the significance of the de Broglie time? The significance is the following. If you look at the interference, let's imagine in our head, I take this wave function and I square it. Remember, if I square, I get the density, right? When I square, on the right-hand side, I'm going to have diagonal terms and cross terms. Cross terms are the terms that involve different momenta. The diagonal terms involve the same momenta. The diagonal terms, the time dependence would be canceled, it will be gone. The off-diagonal terms, because they involve different K, they involve different omega, the time dependence is not gone. And the time dependence is there. So in general, the cross terms are the interesting terms in the sense that they are the terms that signify you have interference substructure, these interference fringes on the scale of the broadly scale. And they tell you this interference substructure actually evolve with time. They are transient mm -hmm. and they evolve on the broadly time scale. Um, in other words, if you look at a halo in wave that matter, it has actually two kinds of substructure. One is the same as WIM dark matter. You might know in WIM dark matter, there's substructure in the form of subhalos, which are basically stable, smaller halo embedded inside, let's say the big Milky Way halo, right? Sometimes you'll call them satellite galaxies or satellite halos. So those are there at some level in wave dark matter as well. But in addition, wave dark matter have this interference substructure on the de Broglie scale, and they are not even stable. They are transient. They uh, come and go on the de Broglie time scale. Uh, the de Broglie time scale, I wish I wrote down the actual time scale, but if you choose 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, the de Broglie time scale can be pretty long, millions of years. Even though they are transient, they are long enough to do interesting things uh, to give you astronomical signal. Okay, so this is, this is my one slide, kind of a very quick review of interference substructure. Any questions about this? I don't see any here. Okay. One, sorry, one. Okay. I'm not sure if my question will make more sense, but these solitos will be forming this head in the in the center of the halo, right? So, a solid soliton in the center of halo, yeah. Should I worry that they may infall inside the black holes in the center of galaxies? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good question. Um, they are, they are, it, it, the influence can go both ways, right? So the super, we know center of galaxy often have mass, uh, supermassive black holes. So the black hole could influence the structure of the soliton or the soliton can actually accrete onto the black hole and change its mass, for example, or change the environment. Both, both of those things could happen and it really depends on the precise um, environment, precise parameters and density. Uh, but, but you are right, there are, there are interesting questions that have to do with how the black holes uh, and the surrounding dark matter, in particular soliton interact, yeah. It's, it's a whole separate subject, which unfortunately I don't have time to discuss today. Uh, you will find some short discussions in the video. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. All right. Um, Ma Marco, how much time do I have? Maybe 10 minutes? 13. Uh, 13, perfect. So I want to tell you at least one kind of fun manifestation of this interference substructure, okay? And is in the form of what is it? It's actually pretty simple to understand. Uh, um, and is the following, uh, actually, let me think about what's the best way to explain it. I also want to spend a little bit time telling you about experimental uh, implications. So I'm going to be extremely brief on what is it. So, so it turns out the following is true. I'm just going to show you this picture. Um, 
imagine uh, imagine you have places with uh, destructive interference, yeah, which is basically inevitable because you have all these waves with uh, random faces. And let's imagine, in fact, the extreme where the disruptive interference is complete, where the density or the wave function is exactly zero, which sounds kind of like a strange thing to say, but it turns out it occurs fairly frequently. You actually find these places where you have complete disruptive interference at the frequency of one per the broadly volume, actually. So they, they actually occurs with some frequency. And so let's imagine this is the purple line. It represents locations where the wave function have complete destructive interference. So the purple line denote the places where the wave function is actually exactly zero. Now you might wonder why it actually forms a line. That's actually a fairly simple argument. The argument is something like this. Uh, if you have a, a wave function which has real and imaginary parts, for it to vanish, both parts have to vanish. And if you are in three-dimensional space, let's imagine the set of points where the real part vanish. If you think about it generically, it will be some kind of service. And for the imaginary part to also vanish, it will be another surface. And where they cross is basically a line. So generically, the set of points where the wave function vanish will be a line. And if you ask, what about the phase of the wave function? The, phase, the wave function has to be single value as you wrap around that line. And in fact, in general, the phase would have winding and winding basically integers of two pi and is basically that integer. And if you recall the phase, the gradient of the phase is the velocity of the fluid. The fact that the phase wraps around tells you there is non-trivial velocity circulation if you integrate around that loop and is actually quantized. This is one of those fun consequences of uh, having wave that matter, that these vortices uh, exist. In fact, the generic prediction is you should have these vortices uh, basically one per the broadly volume and in fact, these vortices, they, in general, they are like kind of like magnetic fields. They don't close, that, sorry, they are not, they cannot end arbitrarily. In fact, they form a closed loop. So in fact, it's a vortex ring. Uh, and there's much more I can say about it. Unfortunately, due to the lack of time, I would have to skip over, and, but I do want to spend at least the last five minutes telling you about some observational and experimental implications. But this, this, this is all I'm going to say about vortices, that these are kind of a generic prediction. And one could hope to find observational signatures associated with them. Um, but let me just pause here. I went by so fast, uh, there might be questions on this particular subject. One. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how do we justify the... Uh... Phases being randomly distributed? The phases, yeah, good. So the, here, it's, uh, there are two different kinds of phases you should uh, think about. So there is, let's go back here. Excellent question. This phase is randomly distributed and is the phase of individual uh, plane waves, if you want. Once you add them together, this is the total wave function. That total wave function, of course, can also be decomposed into a, a total, uh, the net amplitude and a net phase. When I say that's winding, I'm referring to that net phase, not to this phase. Does that make any sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. And that net phase, just by topological reasons, if you have, this is kind of like a topological defect, if you want, where the wave function vanishes, mm -hmm. that phase, that total phase has to wrap around, actually, is unavoidable. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Other questions? Sorry, I have to go pretty fast. I'm going to, in the brief time remaining, uh, you can see I'm skipping a lot of slides. Apologize for that. Uh, if we have another Lestrus 
next time maybe I can come and tell you the rest. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a lot. Okay, so I want to tell you end with some just very brief discussions of uh, observational and experimental signatures. So observational signatures, if the dark matter, wave dark matter is actually ultra light, the de Broglie wavelength is long enough that you can actually see its manifestation in astronomical data. And primarily, I would say there are two ways to see it. One way is to see uh, it in the form of gravitational lensing. So uh, astronomers can observe cases where the system, they would call it, uh, they are strongly lensed. So you find, let's say a background quasar far away and they see a double image. And those images are actually can be highly magnified, especially if the images are very, very close to each other. They are very close to what I call the critical line where the magnification actually formally diverge. Um, and the magnification can actually be, can be over 100. It turns out in this extreme configuration, you can actually show the relative magnification of the two images to be the same. If one is magnified by 100 compared to the original, the other should be basically also 100. The relative magnification should be equal to one. Now, this interference substructure on the scale of the broadly wavelength, if the broadly wavelength is smaller than the image separation, they would preferentially magnify one image over another and cause a differential magnification. And that is something that actually is observable. So there's effect number one. This phenomenon is called flux anomaly. Another observable is actually uh, tidal streams. Um, when uh, people look at, for example, globular clusters inside the Milky Way, tidal forces causes a disruption of the globular clusters so that the streams, there are streams of stars that leave the globular cluster as it circulate, go around, orbit around the Milky Way halo. And these stars over time actually get scattered by any kind of substructure, including this uh, broadly sized interference substructure. And it would do something like this. Suppose the stream originally is a nice smooth circle, this purple looking circle, and it's going around the Milky Way halo. Over time, it would get distorted into these green, basically streams due to basically gravitational scattering with this substructure. And again, this is something that's observable. And both of these methods is different from the Lyman alpha forest method in the following sense. The Lyman forest method is a way to get at the linear power spectrum and look at the suppression of power at high K. The scattering of streams and the flux anomaly is the opposite. It's trying to get at the substructure on small scale that is caused by interference. And in fact, this substructure go in the opposite direction to linear perturbation theory. In fact, it enhances small scale power. And and it's a, an inevitable, inevitable consequence of having interference. Basically, you always have this interference substructure on the broadly scale. And these are two promising methods to look for that substructure. Now, in the very brief time remaining, I want to tell you a little bit, just a little bit about uh, experimental implication, which I get that probably a lot of you are interested in. And here, the dark matter mass need not be ultra light. If, for example, it could be 10 to the minus six electron volts, like, like the target mass of an ADMX experiment. And as you, as you might know, uh, axion detection experiment largely relies on uh, interactions of this sort. So there's interaction of the axion phi with FF duo, this is FF duo of the photon. This little F here is what I call the axion decay constant earlier, okay? Earlier, I call it capital F. Here, I use little f. So this is one uh, interaction. The other interaction is the interaction of the axion with fermions. Psi can be uh, leptons, could be quarks. The gamma five is there uh, in, in, uh, for an axion, which is a pseudoscalar. Both of these interactions are fairly natural because they are both shift symmetric. 
for the for the axion. Remember, the axion really originate as a gold stone, so it's very natural to consider shift symmetric interactions. And uh, there are many experiments in the literature. I cannot hope to actually go through all of them. But what I want to emphasize is each of these experiments, they measure different combinations of the axion field. Some of them measure time, grad time gradient. Some of them measure spatial gradient, if you want. The one that measures spatial gradient is sensitive to basically this interaction. The one that measures time gradient is sensitive to this interaction, for example. Uh, now, what does the wave nature of the dark matter imply for these experiments? That's what I want to end with, right? Uh, first of all, let me show you this picture. Remember now, we have the wave function and we have this e to the IMT, the combination give us the axion field itself, right? And you should always keep in mind something like this. Psi is something that varies on time scale that's low compared to M. M is the oscillation frequency. And this is a fast time scale. This is a slow time scale. And psi, remember, is a superposition of waves with random phases. So psi is something that is like stochastic. Whereas this oscillation is basically deterministic. It always oscillates at frequency M. If you combine these two features together and ask at a given location, how does the axion field phi behave? It probably looks like this picture. You will see rapid oscillation on small time scale, which I, which I call here, which is of the order one over M. If you plug in 10 to the minus six electron volt, this is in this short time scale, 10 to the minus nine seconds. However, there would be a modulation of the oscillation amplitude, this slow modulation, due to this stochastic psi waves. And the time scale of that variation is much longer, is the de Broglie time. And if you plug in the numbers, it's 10 to the minus three seconds. These are time scales that are accessible to direct detection experiments. They are not accessible to, you know, to our astronomer friends using telescopes, but they are accessible to direct detection experiments. And therefore this wave nature is actually relevant to these experiments. Uh, this is a big subject, but I just want to leave you with some thought. Huh? Um, the fact that this is so stochastic field means um, it's very natural to think of detection experiments as a measurement or an attempt to measure correlation function. You can consider correlation function in time. You can consider correlation function in space. You can find these expressions in the review. I'm not going to have time to tell you where they come from. One note since we talk about vortices, um, at the location where phi is zero, where you have vortices, imagine you have a vortex passing through one of the detectors. Some of these experiments will see a zero signal when that happens. But some of these experiments, because they are sensitive to spatial gradient, they will not see zero. This is the spatial gradient. There is actually not zero at the location of what it is. And so that's sort of interesting. And perhaps actually, uh, maybe perhaps even more tantalizing if you want, is that the existence of vortices is telling us that there is interesting information in the phase of this wave function. It has interesting space-time structure. Um, and it could well be true and is something that we are actively thinking about. When thinking about uh, axion dark matter detection, it will be interesting in addition to thinking about trying to attempt to measure the amplitude of the oscillation, which is a, a big part of what axion detection is about, is to actually also think about the phase. Um, I will just leave this at that. I will just leave you with the last slide, which is a summary of what we have gone over. Our, uh, our four topics, uh, fundamental physics motivations, the basic dynamics, and very, very briefly, the astrophysical and experimental implications. I think I'll end here. Thank you very much. Let me, let me see if there are questions here. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, so I have one uh, concerning these solid towns. Uh, so you mentioned yeah. uh, the tend to form near the Galactic Center. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering about the possibility of these forming some kind of sub halo towards the uh, outer reaches of the galaxy or something like this. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that is certainly a possibility. So what we know is the following, that if you look, go to smaller and smaller halo, the soliton actually occupy a larger and larger fraction of that halo. And so it could well be there are sub halos of the Milky Way, let's say, which originally started off with uh, um, you know, a, a halo that has a central region, which is soliton, with some outer region, which is not a soliton. But over time, that outer region gets stripped away, tidally stripped away, and leaving you with just a soliton left. That could well be what uh, some of these very small galaxy might actually be that. That could well happen, yeah. Well, I guess uh, we could also have some higher mass solitons, something really dense, right? Or are these ripped apart somehow as well? Yeah, high mass, the high mass soliton can be really dense and the really dense ones, they would not be so easy to tidally disrupt. Uh, it turns out, and this is an interesting story I didn't have to go, I didn't have time to go into. It turns out the wave nature actually means there is another mechanism for tidal disruption. It's basically, in some sense, some sort of tidal disruption that is um, different from the usual particle dark matter tidal disruption. And it's due to the quantum pressure of, of the soliton, actually. Um, yeah, that's a whole another subject. It's some kind of evaporation, actually. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Okay, so I don't see any other question here nor in the chat. So thank you very much again, Lan. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me let me just add that. Uh, please take a look at the review, and if you have further questions, just send me an email. You you you, you can find me in my email very easily. I hope. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the school.